So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It is Thursday. Ooh, what is the date today? Thursday, August 6th. And this is our episode of Perspectives. We have a very special guest with us. This is Dr. Alex Evans, who is joining us. He's from Marin Health up north in the Bay Area, which is close to my heart, being a Bay Area girl. And he is also the husband of a former classmate of mine, um, who also danced with me at UCSD. So lots of connections here today. Um, and I think we were in the same graduating class from UC San Diego. So you're an alum and one of our other co-hosts here is an alum as well. So today on Perspectives, what we were thinking is to bring three co-hosts to really just get a well-rounded conversation on what's going on right now with COVID-19. So I brought back with me Alexis Dixon from Interiors. We've got Steve Chapel from Great Minds. Uh, which is right now Great Minds in Quarantine. And then we have Abel Gutierrez from Science Squawk. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. And I'm going to hand it over to, um, to the co-hosts. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Dr. Evans, thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me. How are things up there? How is the climate? How is the weather up there? What do you uh, see that you want to just share with us just off the top? I mean, things are, things, it's beautiful weather up here in Marin, so there's no doubt there. <laughs> so great day to spend some time outside, of course, of course social distancing, um, no complaints. Is Good. Marin in kind of a bubble, the way that San Diego could be seen as, um, that infectious cases are, are, are fewer, even in San Diego, shockingly, but interestingly, 95% of deaths are from comorbidities, um, which I don't think is so high elsewhere. Yeah. What's going on in Marin that's different than the rest of California? Marin is interesting because of the fact that, well, first of all, I'm trying to not travel too much out of Marin. Uh, so to tell you the truth, really, the only place I've been is up in Sacramento and maybe a little bit in Sonoma County, which is north of us. But Marin County is very interesting. Uh, here, you can absolutely tell that people took this quite seriously in terms of the pandemic. Uh, I rarely find people when you're out and about uh, without a mask, rarely find uh, people not appropriately social distancing. Um, people are on the ball. Um, what's interesting here is that we, we have had a uh, per capita higher rate as compared to other counties just because we had a massive outbreak at the San Quentin prison, uh, mm -hmm. which is located in the most beautiful um, region in Marin, right there uh, next to the Richmond Bridge. And they had about 2,300 cases, and that's excluding the guards. And we had to take a lot of those patients. So our numbers look worse when you look at the New York Times in terms of the per capita. Um, mm -hmm. But when you look at the actual patients that are coming into the hospital, um, outside of those, uh, uh, the inmates, it's primarily uh, patients who are, are working a lot. Uh, what I would say is uh, people who are also on the uh, front line doing jobs, real large uh, Latinx, uh, uh, Hispanic uh, population in terms of the cases that we're seeing. Um, they make up only 16% of our uh, county, and they make up 75% of our admissions to the hospital. Wow. So and that's outside of uh, prisoners from San Quentin. Yes. So you could tell who the essential workers are in Marin, as well as other, other places, probably, in, I would assume, in the entire state. Uh, so I'm not sure if there's any sort of risk factor there in terms of, I'll, I'll be honest with you, most of our patients are obese or borderline obese um, and or diabetic. Those are extreme risk factors. Age is another big risk factor in terms of severity of disease. And I'm seeing these patients. I'm going in the rooms. I'm seeing them every single day. So I saw uh, many patients today, um, some uh, hanging on by a, th a thread, hanging, off, uh, hanging on for their life, others not so sick. And so it's, 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 it's an interesting disease. Um, you have a wide range of illness. Uh, ranging from people who are asymptomatic and are humming a nice tune to others who are in overwhelming sepsis and they have bad pneumonia and are on the ventilator and close to death. It's, it's, it's really just such a fascinating illness. I hate to put it that way, that something, that something this deadly can be fascinating. But from an infectious disease specialist like myself, uh, we see this and, and the fascinating parts help, to help us to uh, 
create better care for these patients. You know, one of the things that, I mean, I think you touched on it a bit is kind of how this disease is expressed um, in, different ge- in different demographics, specifically age with the call by the president for kids to go back to school, and yeah. then ethnicity, culturally. Can you talk about how that disease is expressing itself in both uh, the age demographic and the cultural ethnic demographic? It is absolutely devastating certain demographics in terms of ethnicities. Uh, the, uh, black, brown, uh, you name it, um, it's just just been devastating. I mean, it not, it, not necessarily here in Marin. Um, we're, we, we have a huge uh, Latinx, uh, Hispanic population. That's probably our largest uh, demographic. Uh, we do not have a, a large black African-American uh, demographic here. Uh, other than uh, as you compared to other East Bay counties. Uh, but when you look at other parts of the nation, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, these demographics are just absolutely getting pummeled. I think I've, I'm looking at uh, per capita numbers in, the, in some of these Southern counties in Texas. And it's just, it's gut-wrenching to see. And their hospitals are to, are to the max. I mean, they've had to build out hospitals outside. And so we're lucky we're not seeing that. We, we flatten the curve here in Marin. We know this. We, we, we got on top of it. We got on top of it quickly. We got so lucky early in this pandemic. What happened here, and, it's, and this is not something that was relatively known much in terms of a, 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 a layman knowledge. We got really lucky. What happened in Marin was that they were doing testing, secret testing for COVID early in March. Mm-hmm. And it was being done by Stanford they had their own little secret test and it wasn't FDA approved. And that was the issue with the testing because you had to have FDA approved test. The CDC test was garbage. It was not being, it was not being able to be reproduced. So Stanford was doing its own secret study. And what happened was the study that they ran, it was later published in the MMWR, which is a CDC publication about a month later. And so we got the chance to read it. But what they published sometime around the middle of the month was that they took patients who presented to clinics that were presenting with flu, and in those patients who were negative for flu, they screened those patients without knowing for COVID-19. And they found that six, some, I believe 6% of those patients were positive for COVID-19. And as soon as they got that data, all the Bay Area counties closed down the next day, including Marin. And that, that, that just flattened the curve immediately. Later, LA did, I think was maybe a few days later, if they had run that study in New York City, no one else, nowhere else in the country were they running a similar study. They would have found that sort of signature that 6% is an unbelievably large number of outpatients with any sort of disease like this. That's so hyper, ability to be hyper spread. So we got really lucky. Things locked down. The problem was Memorial Day. That was the problem. <laughs> How so? What happened on Memorial Day? I mean, it might be people obvious. People got out. People left. People, people decided, hey, hey, we flattened this curve. We can kind of, you know, hey, you know, I'm not sure these masks or social distance, have a big barbecue, have a birthday party, you know, this sort of thing. It just takes one person. And we don't know who these people are. There are these people, we, there are people called hyper spreaders, where one person can spread it to 30. Most people aren't like that. Most people will be like one, maybe to spread to two, um, because there's a certain term, it's called an R factor. And this R factor for uh, COVID-19 is around a two to a three. So one person can spread to two to three, but you have people that are hyper spreaders where happy birthday to you, and then everyone gets it. And I've had those patients. We, we get people to come into the hospital like, well, how did you get this? We're like, oh, I went to a birthday party and everyone got sick at it. My well, how, what, what yeah. makes hyper spreader? Is it more virus in the back of their throat? Like- Possibly. And that's still, to, that's still being researched. What's fascinating is that we've seen it with other coronaviruses. So it's not a new concept. It's uh-huh. not a new concept. They saw this with the original SARS epidemic 20 years ago. They saw this with the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, the MERS virus. In Korea, there were hyper spreaders. There was these patients who were hospitalized and they spread it to like all the nurses and so we knew that this was a possibility. The question is, though, what about kids? And that's, that's the most interesting thing because we're getting misleading data. 
some data saying, well, we haven't had much in terms of spread in data that we look at from Australia and New Zealand, where there maybe wasn't much spread. And then you look at data from Israel where they had to shut down tons and tons of schools. And so you have to really get in the nitty gritty and see what were they doing? Were they doing, it's not just one intervention that helps here. There are multiple interventions and, and that's the complexity. It's not just about wearing a mask. You can have more face shields. You can design classrooms differently. You can test them. You can cohort them. You can uh, change class sizes. You can have them outside. There's all sorts of interventions and all of them are going to be really impactful um, and so challenging for the schools. I, 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 I'm not jealous of them by one iota. And uh, they're not paid enough to really ma- to honestly have all this. And the fact that you have the government threatening to shut down payments uh, for them is even more uh, ludicrous. Well, you have children. What do you think uh, is the, in a, in a word, what's the best way to organize a classroom? Or are, are you going to keep them home? Start small, work your way up. That's really the key thing. Um, I think there's no doubt children can spread this illness. However, they are, we have not heard many case reports of hyper spreading in the school environment, like what we're talking about, those hyper spreaders. Number two, for whatever reason, children have a low propensity to have hospitalization or even bad outcomes with this. Um, can they bring it home to their parents? No doubt. And I've seen it and I can tell you anecdotally, it definitely can happen. Um, what we need to do is start small, work yourself up. So what I mean is, is that we don't necessarily need to have like a super advanced or rigorous curriculum in the beginning here. (laughs) You know, you just want to see what you can get done, maybe have a couple classes and just see what happens. And it literally is like an experiment in the works. And that's what we're doing anyway. I mean, everything we're doing right now is still fairly experimental. It's not like we have perfect science with every single thing that we're doing. What we're waiting for and what is going to be an absolute game changer is literally having like a card where you can test kids on the spot, like a pregnancy test, rapid, swab the nose, test them, you good, go in the classroom. And that's going, to be, that's going to be available soon. Really? Yeah. Okay. I How mean, accurate will it be, do you think? It's not going to be as accurate as like the test that I have in the hospital. But if you do tests like this on a, like a daily, like a consecutive basis, one day, two days, three days, that increases accuracy. It increases accuracy the number of times you do it. So you may miss a shutter one day if you do it a consecutive day. So you may, you may want to establish protocols based on that but it's better than nothing. And, and you have other parts in this country which unfortunately are doing nothing, where they believe this disease is a hoax or they, don't, they, they just believe what they want to believe that their immune system is going to take care of it. And you know, for the most part, a person's immune system does do a pretty good job with it. But I will tell you, I see the people's, people whose immune system don't do a good job with it. And then some of these people are pretty darn young. I have a guy in his 30s who we're about to discharge into the hospital, but he spent a good uh, one, one, one week, one and a half weeks there. And if I didn't give him medicine to get him over the hump, he probably would not have made it. Let me uh, jump in here just to kind of uh, touch on some of the, the points you made. Because um, I've been having conversations with some of the researchers in the area, uh, both there and the impact it's having on the schools, coming back to schools. And so when we talk about the essential workers, right? So I'm in an area uh, that is mostly service, uh, you know, service sector um, in my zip code. And you can see there's, I think the rate is like something like 1,700 cases per 100,000 if you extrapolate versus La Jolla, you're down to like 400 cases per 100,000. But now you have these kids that go back to school. They're not necessarily going to wear their masks correctly. They're going to be in tight quarters. They may be more subjected to uh, uh, or initially getting uh, infected from their parents who are in these service sector jobs. They go to schools, there's mixed environments. They will then transfer these onto other counties. So there's no real way to contain, right? You, you say, well, there's not as many cases here in this county or this county, but once they go back to school, all bets are off. And that's the experiment I think we're kind of running into. I mean, what are your thoughts around once all that starts to commingle? If that, if that is yeah. the case. That, that's, you know, like I said, that's, there's going to be a mix there. 
And yeah, kids aren't that dependable. I mean, it's, you know, wearing masks, hand hygiene, and, and all these things, cough etiquette, um, and pot- potentially wearing face shields. There's, I mean, if you intermix a lot of different interventions, you undoubtedly will decrease transmission. There's no doubt there. Um, so it can be done. And I would say that at least in our county, they're mixing some things. They're going to trial in some very low amounts of virtual for most of the students, but they're going to have some in-person for very, very small cohort groups. You got to keep them within the same group, no real big mixing and uh, keeping the same teacher. I'm actually worried about the teachers the most, to be frankly honest with you. I think the kids are going to do statistically pretty fine. Although, like I said, if you, if you, if you're dealing with, kids in the millions, you may see one bad outcome there. So it's, it it is possible, but I'll be honest with you, the rates that we're seeing in the flu in terms of, I mean, sorry, the COVID-19, when you compare it to the flu, the flu virus is actually arguably almost as dangerous as COVID-19 in children, in children. It's when you get to the adulthoods that this COVID-19 illness seems to be much more pathogenic than the influenza A virus. Um, both these have to be uh, have to be dealt with, and it's going to be even more interesting in the fall once we start getting uh, influenza A in the mix, because right, we know. Next yeah. Question there. Sorry. Like what That's the okay. impact I, is? Sorry. Yeah, go, ahead. Go, ahead. Oh, go ahead, Abel. Yeah. Um, no, I, I was going to ask you what you what you thought since we're just getting into that season. What's what's the impact on the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system, once? flu gets in right now you've got two burdens right uh yeah yeah the the, the fortunate thing is the same thing we're doing to protect ourselves from COVID-19 undoubtedly protects us from the flu so all these interventions all these things all are going to be exceedingly helpful so we are looking at data at least preliminary data out of the southern hemisphere because it's winter for them now they have the flu season we base a lot of our flu season based on what they see in Australia they're seeing very low rates right now all these interventions are certainly helping. Problem is, is that a lot of people don't believe in the flu shot. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can see there's a lot of what we call vaccine hesitancy out there. I can't have vaccine hesitancy. It's pretty much required to work in the hospital to get one. And I even knew nurses that would have anaphylactic reactions to flu shot. They would still get it just to protect their patients. It's not about them. It's protecting their patients, honestly. Um, that's really the key thing. It's about protecting yourself, but also protecting others because you can spread this. Um, but we, we don't know what's going to happen with the flu. And that's why having really orga- organization protocols on testing, because you're going to have to have testing available for the flu as well. You're going to have to differentiate the, these two. You're going to have to have it available in the school. You have to have available for kids that may not have insurance. Um, this has all got to be right then and there. And what a what a what a huge task to put on like a school nurse is she trained to do something like this so we have to therefore depend on the local health departments to flex out um their staff but they're already understaffed anyway why do i know this i used to work for my local health department they cut my job because they're trying to save money a few years ago guess what they've done that throughout the whole country cut health department jobs they they want, they want us when they need us, but not all the time. And that's the same thing with even our federal government. They had a pandemic task force. They cut it last year. They had a, a, a task force. Their whole job was to plan for a pandemic. And when a pandemic hit, they would work on every single variable on what to do. Oh, we'll get rid of it. We won't need it until you actually need it and not even restart it when you do need it. It's a rather chilling Vanity Fair story that's being quoted everywhere that once it was believed that the only people in the blue states, mainly New York, California, were going to die, that uh, people around uh, Kushner and Trump said, fine, let them go. And they were too sort of, let's say, non science oriented to realize that (laughs) once they tried to open up the southern states, it was a boomerang effect. Uh, that that you, you, hit the, you hit the nail on a hammer. Just look at the data right now. And that's probably why a lot of these people are promoting mask use. It was, it was a month or two too late, but they're looking at it. And you can look at per capita stuff right now, death rates and stuff like that. These, uh, California is low on the list per 100,000, especially when you look at per 100,000 the last seven days. All those states 
other than I believe Nevada is, is, is kind of in there around number eight or number 10. All those states, unfortunately, is what you call either purple or red states or whatever uh, people want to call them. And, it, and it's unfortunate. We knew this. It, I mean, the, the problem with this virus is it doesn't differentiate between anyone's voting patterns. And, and the problem is, is that uh, a lot, an, an unfortunate thing is a, lo a lot of these people that are living in these states aren't practicing the good habits that at least people here in Marin and, and probably almost undoubtedly there down there in San Diego and La Jolla are doing. And it's, and it's just like, it's, I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm doing it for my neighbor, you know, and my, and you know, the grandmother down the street, I, I'm good. I, I can wear a mask. I mean, I mean, you guys see the stuff that I wear when I go in these patients rooms. I, I wear like, tons of gear. I mean, all, all people need to do is wear a simple little face mask. That's not asking too much. That's not asking much. I mean, think about our, our boys and girls going to fight World War II and stuff like that, giving up their lives. All we're asking is people to wear a simple mask. It's just, it's just not asking much. You know, to that end, um, you know, and we've talked about it, but I really just want you to just say it clearly and plainly. Can you talk about community spread? What does that mean? How is this thing transmitted? So I want folks who are looking that are not scientists to really hear clearly the fact from the mythology of how this is spread. Yeah. What is community spread and how is this thing transmitted? Community spread. So community spread was the first case was actually up here close to me in Solano County. It's the first case. Although they did, I think, determine that there was community spread before that. But that was the first case. Um, so what that means is that it was not associated with a, a case that came from a different country. It wasn't associated with travel. It was just a spontaneous case where they don't know where this person got it from. Well, they obviously got it from someone else. So that, that's, that's really community spread. But this virus is a tricky one. So remember, this is a coronavirus. Coronaviruses are, are a very common cause of the common cold. So we see these all the time every year. Some of them tend to be more pathogenic. And so we've seen, we get a new coronavirus every 10 years. We had the SARS epidemic in the early 2000 decade. And then we had the MERS about five to 10 years ago. That was primarily in Canada, North Korea, and the Middle East. What we saw with those viruses is that similar to other coronaviruses, people tend to only spread it once they had symptoms. So it was pretty easy to stop those epidemics because, hey, I have a cough, I therefore then put myself in quarantine. The problem with this illness and the problem which where community spread just went haywire is that they have determined that this virus starts to spread before someone is sick. So the first day or two before you even have a cough, before you have a fever, you could be like you and I, you, us right now, talking without any symptoms and spreading it. But you and can still be tested for it if you do the good PCR test. If you, test, you, if you would, tested it, you'd be positive. You would be you, absolutely positive. Yeah, you would be positive. And so that this was first published in a case report in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is basically the main journal that everyone reads in, in medicine. It's got the highest impact factor, meaning that it's got the most in terms of citations anywhere, that there was a case of, of spread in a German traveler before that person had symptoms and then no one was like, no way, no way, this can't be true. And this not, cannot be true. How do you even publish this? This couldn't be true. It was true. And it put shockwaves through the world. And, and it just, it was a whole new ball game. And then it just, there you go. It's like, we'll try screening travelers coming in with fever. Oh, good luck. There's going to be a lot of travelers who may not have fever and are just walking right through that little buzzer. Um, so that, that's ultimately what happened. Um, and may, we may have prevented a little bit of uh, uh, transmission through, uh, through uh, you know, testing for fevers and things like that. And we're still doing that in hospitals um, because obviously you want to, um, you know, stop someone from coming in that obviously has a fever. Um, but a person is most infectious a day or two before any symptoms. And that's Can what has led to the explosion of community uh, spread. How long does it take before... Um, it sort of manifests there. Let's say you get infected yeah. before you can begin to spread, or does that depend on the person? Five, day. five viral. days average. Yeah, it's about five days average. Probably at most 10 days, what we call an incubation period. Some illnesses have long incubation period, like for instance, like mumps. Everyone knows what mumps yeah. is. 
that incubation period is tricky. It's like three weeks. So it's, so if someone gets exposed to mumps at work, you can have to quarantine them off for like three weeks. They get, they get a vacation for like a month. This is five days. Initially, they, they, the 14 days was sort of like the incubation. You're, you're free if you've been exposed and you're symptom free for 14 days. They've kind of really kind of come down to around the 10 day mark now. Um, but I still see 14 days in a, in a lot of the um, uh, guidance. Um, so by then, the, here's the tricky part with this illness is that unlike the flu, it, well, it's similar to the flu, but it's unlike the flu. Unlike the flu, a person gets kind of mildly sick. They're like, I got a tiny cough one day, two day, three days. Oh, and then I'm a little short of breath, four days, five days, six days, seven days in the hospital, in the ICU. So it's got what we call a subacute onset. It's not like the flu, which hits you like a tank and puts you in bed that first day. Now, some cases may be like that. Some cases of COVID, now I'm not saying that every case is not going to be like that, but the average case is a mild, subtle cough, mild, low grade to maybe high grade fever, but not as much as what you would say classically with the influenza A virus. Um, so it, it, it's different. It's like I said, it's interesting, right? But what happens is when you're sick for longer and you're not as sick, guess what? You go out more, you interact more, you still go to work more, you still hang out with your family. You may not wash your hands as good enough. So you do all these interventions, um, you really minimize your, your contagiousness. And so we've been really vigilant about here, especially at my institution, with hand hygiene, masking. Um, I even do something called foot hygiene at the hospital too. What it means is that I clean the bottom of my shoes in and out of almost every room, especially if I'm seeing a COVID patient because it's on the floor too, by the way. Hey, well, people do that going into labs, right? Yeah. You know, all over La Jolla, you know, you have to put on booties, et yep. cetera. Yep, it's transmitted in... It's transmitted in stool too. So it's transmitted in, in people's uh, feces. Um, uh, there was an outbreak in, in, a, in, a, in a condominium in Hong Kong because the sewer system backed up. Well, you know, I still have this one question. Okay, let's say you go to that birthday party unwisely and you get infected. Um, how long before? Is it three days, four days, five, before it can be detected? Because the really testing question. company I, I consult to is saying they can find it in three or four, but it sort of depends on that. The test yeah. make a It really big. depends on the test. It really does. The, the testing depends. Yeah, not all testing is created equal. I'm just going to put it that, that way. I'm going to put yeah. the adage on there. We in Marin have this phenomenal test. It's a local test. It's called Cephid. It's the gene expert. It's probably too sensitive. So it means that when our patients get better and we test them, they still test positive because it's just picking up little tiny DNA particles that are probably been obliterated by the immune system. So yes, you will pick it up probably subtly um, within those first few days. There's no doubt, but it's really hard to find those people. Um, but those people do exist. Those people, if you, if you do surveillance on them, a good percentage of them will get sick. But look at this, look at this, 40, up to 40% of people are asymptomatic with this illness, 40% yeah, in, in, in K-series. Think about that. But, Some but of them may spread it. Because um, there was an interesting paper, um, there was some, a paper just a bit ago that kind of um, talked a little bit about the, you know, the cold virus, the coronavirus there, conferring some immunity uh, to people um, that were infected with, uh, with COVID. And I think today, uh, I think it was published um, uh, from LGI, the La Jolla Institute of Immunology. And uh, they said, yeah, that up to 40 to 60% are um, show or, or asymptomatic when they're, when they're infected. But they are finding that these people were previously um, had colds or had exposure to the cold virus, um, which makes it really mild. So therefore, like you said, they, they, they don't feel bad at all. Maybe have a little sniffle, a little, maybe a little tiny itch, and they then still go out and continue to infect people. So they were, there was talk about, based on this information, do we just tell people that have any kind of symptoms, go take your cold medicine, but stay the hell in your room. Yes, oh yeah. <laughs> treat totally. it like it is COVID, even if it's not, because you won't know, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you won't know. And you, know, you won't have that testing because the testing, I mean, what we needed to do in this country is just plain and simple. I mean, we, we have perfect examples in modern countries on how, what to do and, and how to get on top of this. South Korea, 
did it the best. Why, why, why South Korea of all places? Because they had to deal with the, the mayor's um, coronavirus about five to 10 years ago. So they learned their lesson the bad way. And so they were able to ramp up quickly and just put out little fires here and there, testing, testing, testing. They tested every person, no matter what complaint they had. You could, you could have no complaints. They tested every single person. You have it. We isolate you. We put out little fires and they had amazing contact tracing. So that means you have public health officials talking to people and then they, they use cell phones to see where those people went, where they had gone to. And then they, 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 then they, then they would test those places too. So if we had done that early on when it was much smaller, we would have been better off. But in terms of this immunity, we'll see what these asymptomatic people where a lot of them, you test them and you find antibodies, but we're still learning a little bit about these antibody tests. And we're still learning about what we call quantitative antibodies, where they measure the amount of antibody and wh whether the amount of antibody they have will be protective from fu future bouts of this. What so they're what's finding is with vaccines, they are finding overwhelmingly large amounts of antibody production with some of these new vaccines that are almost like 40 times the amount that you'll even get what we call with plasma infusion. So people, some people are experimenting with plasma to treat this disease, although it's not a proven therapy by any means. And in fact, I'm not necessarily even on the bandwagon for that type of therapy because, the, <laughs> because this, this illness is so complex. By the time they come to the hospital, the patients have already been developing antibodies this, this illness is such a challenge because when they come in, they're already like, the damage has been done. That's the problem is that people are looking for medicines to give these people. This disease is such a challenge and it's, it, it comes at you in like five different ways. And what's perplexed doctors is that they want a simple cookbook on how to treat this. Good luck. It's not there. Patients come in with like 15 different ways and they come in like 10 different stages of illness. And so each one of these things, you treat it differently. And, it's, it's, and it's, it's just befuddled doctors on how to treat this. So again, I can go all, all, on all day about this, but in terms of the immunity, that's getting a lot of, getting a lot of, getting a lot of play, a lot of testing. Um, we'll see what that comes out to um, and how protective it is. But the, the vaccine immunity is actually looking quite good so far in these phase two studies. Well, if you have, the, if you have the, the blood and the antibodies, do you feel confident that that, that, that protects you, that the person's had it and it's over, or is that uh, variable as well? With, uh, it's, it, right now, that's, we, we don't know. And so we're, we will know. We have really good cohorts where we're going to be able to study. <laughs> the best cohort that I can't wait till there's data published on was an outbreak on an aircraft carrier. Guess what? It's like 60 to 70% of them got exposed, most asymptomatic. These people are going to be followed up. And so they'll be testing these people to see how protected they are. This was that big aircraft carrier, remember, where the Admiral got, got, got uh, removed after uh, obviously doing some things be on email and behind the chain of command. And they, it was just an overwhelming number. One person, I believe, died on that, on that ship um, from this. So it shows you that, that, that young people can get pretty sick with this. But most are asymptomatic. I am waiting for the data published from these individuals on how protective their antibodies will be. So it, it I mean, but thing is, though, that's the sort of data you need to look at six, three to six months later. It's, it's, we want it rapidly. But remember, we're only like six months into this pandemic. We're, we're, we're asking for data where I don't even have great data on flu. <laughs> I mean, I'm still trying to learn on how to treat influenza A. Even the medications we have to treat influenza A aren't that good. And so we're looking, trying to get like all this fancy stuff for something that's only been around for six to, six to 10 months. It's, it's asking for a lot, to tell you the truth. And if one of the things they've talked about earlier was the idea of uh, not, not, not only herd immunity, but the transmission of this disease in respect to aerosol versus droplets and how yeah. long the disease can live in the environment. Can you talk about that in terms of, you know, how this is, you know, the, the, how this is transmitted and, and how long it can live in an environment? Yeah, yeah. So this, so this is, uh, so most viruses like this, most respiratory viruses, this are transmitted in the droplet. So these are, these are relatively larger droplets that are expelled from the mouth and that generally travel between as much as four to six feet and then drop down to the earth. 
Um, that is no, but from naturally engaging with one another versus coughing and sneezing. Is there a distinction? Between well, it depends, it depends what you're doing. So if you're coughing, it may theoretically go a little further than six feet. It would have to be a pretty strong cough, but strong talking, singing, singing, I mean, singing loudly, talking loudly, like how I'm talking right now is probably expelling uh, some of these uh, uh, virus particles out in the air, although I don't believe I have it right now. Hopefully not. Um, and, uh, but in terms of aerosolization, so now we're talking aerosolization means an airborne. We generally, uh, we, it, there's, there's debate whether they're, this virus is airborne. Um, it's, it's not really looking like that per se, although it depends on what you're doing. So if you're, if, 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 if you're in the hospital and you're getting this really high flow oxygen and it's blowing air out like at high velocity, then it may be airborne. Um, or if you're um, with a c- certain type of, uh, you're doing a certain type of talking or s- with people singing, like there was, a, there was a, a thought that there was airborne transmission during a choir practice uh, that was uh, in April in Washington where I think like out of 60 people at this choir practice right outside of Seattle, 40 of them got sick. And I, I don't know, I think it was somewhere between 10 to 20 died um, from this right. choir practice. Uh, so they were, ah, you know, you know, spraying virus and, and projecting it with great power. Oh, yeah. That was aerosolizing it. And so that proved that there is a degree of aerosolization to this virus that, like I said, cannot be underestimated. And that's the one thing that we've done from the very beginning is underestimate this virus from the very, very beginning. From the Following very up beginning. Uh, point there, you know, I noticed that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks are saying probably we're going to be mandated, those who care, to wear, you know, a glass coverings, you know, like you would if you were in Woodshop. Do you think that'll start to happen? And also she said, you know, masks in the house if you're around older people. So it sounds like people are, the, it's getting, not yeah. Crazy, but yeah, I mean, they basically they got they, they got they also got to start small too, and just get people to wear a mask in public. I mean, I'll be honest with you, and it's just I think that they've they've already produced so many misleading recommendations that that it's 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 going to be tough. It's going to be it's going to be a challenge, and that's and that's that's the way it is. Where they have equated this to a a you know, it's my right to do what I want to do type of thing as if it's my right to not wear my seatbelt and, you know, do this and do that. Or it's my right to run through a stop sign because what, what it doesn't say in the constitution, I, that I, 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 I can have to stop at a stop sign. It's like, okay, well we have laws and you know, you, the, the things you do actually can hurt other people. Um, that's proven. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, the problem is it's just the, the misleading complaints you have. You know, you, I mean, you had our vice president in the Mayo Clinic who, I mean, I'm sorry to go political, but this is one of those just outrageous things. He's in the Mayo Clinic and everyone around him is wearing a mask. He's seeing patients. He's not in one. And then they interviewed him later on. He says, no one told me I needed to wear a mask. It's like, mm. what? I mean, it's, I you're at the Mayo Clinic and- Everyone there, wouldn't you have asked someone at the time? It's just, it's just, you see those things, people see that, and then you, you get missed messages and, you know, that, that, that's created such, such problem. And because the simple face mask, I'll be honest with you, really cuts down on that transmission. It's not going to cut it down to zero. But if you can knock things down by amazing percentages, you know, it's huge, just like a vaccine. So when the vaccine comes out, it's not going to be 100% effective. Even it's 50% effective, 50%. Think about 50% left people dying. That, that's a huge impact or 50% lost hospitalizations. I mean, there are days at the hospital where I was rounding on like 15 to 20 COVID patients in a row. I would see them back to back to back to back. Um, and it was just, it's tough. It's really tough. Some of them would, some of them, I think we're having a lady who's being discharged today and she has been in the hospital for like 35 days. So um, quite an impact on a given hospital. If you've been in the hospital that long, talk about how hard it might be or not to recover outside and lingering damage, perhaps. Yeah, it it, it really depends. 
what we're seeing, so this illness is such a challenge because a lot of these patients coming in and they're in what we call septic shock. So their blood pressure is low. They're in like full blown uh, two side pneumonia. They get put on the ventilator and we give them tr aggressive treatments, which sometimes can hurt them more. They can get complications with the treatments that we give them. So we got to weigh our, our risks and balances there. They can get things like bacterial pneumonia. Some of them can get something called fungal pneumonia. And, and then they get, they're on the ventilator for days and days, their body gets all weak. And so they're like, almost like in their outer space and in zero gravity, they can't move. They need extensive rehab. Some don't make it. If, if it, you know, it's, it's not a secret. You're over 75, especially, especially in patients we're having from, from nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities where they're over 90, they come in like that. Most of them don't make it. It's, and it's, it, that, that was devastating in New York City, devastating in Italy. Not as devastating here because um, a lot of our nursing homes have been pretty proactive, but they're out there. And like with the smallpox, if there are weeds to burn, they will eventually burn if you don't protect them. If you don't protect them, they will burn if they're there. You know, I'm 71. I'm going to get on an airplane, a five-hour flight uh, to LA. What would you wear on the plane? We look like insects traveling with super N95 masks. We have the goggles. Yeah. But I don't know, when I watch someone like you in a hospital, at least on TV, I see people with like oxygen tanks and rebreathers like they're going down 200 feet with the Navy right underwater. So yeah. I, don't know, is there, I guess, what would you wear if you were going to get on an airplane? That's a really good question because I've not gone. I, I mean, I probably traveled like 50 times on an airplane last year. I've not gone on one this year. <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot. That says a lot, right? It's like, so I haven't gone on one. But, but they say my, my frequent flyer mileage is, is, is still good for the next year. So my, my, I'm, still, I'm still good. But, uh, yeah, I probably would um, wear it, – it, dep it, it, depends on the, it depends on the airline, honestly. If they're, they got them packed in and you can't socially distance – you would probably want to wear um, a good mask, which would be potentially an N95 mask if you can, if you can acquire one. Oh, um, yeah. A simple face mask would be at the bare minimum. Um, whether you want to wear goggles or not, that's sort of up to you. It's a debate whether how much transmission is going to occur through the eyes. You're going to have to practice immaculate hand hygiene. To be honest with you, I used to not touch anything on an airplane even before COVID. I was one of those people who would get on the airplane. I'd take out my wet wipe and clear everything down because I knew that they only clean the airplane once a day. Um, so I didn't want E. coli on my hands anyway. Um, so um, not that I was a so-called germaphobe. I'm just a realist. I just didn't want dirt on my hands. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, I was doing that before because I just don't want to get sick. I don't want to miss days of work. This is before COVID. Um, so, but it really depends on the airline. It's, it's tough to travel these days. It's tough to social distance. They do have HEPA filters on the airplane. It sounds like they're not doing as much drink services, which is probably smart because that's where people um, take off their masks. Just don't touch your face much. Use really good hand hygiene. I mean, it's about 20 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds. Um, I mean, my first class that I give my medical students, it's not rocket science. There's a few things I teach them. First class, it's like, number one, Here's how you wash your hands. You will save many lives if you learn how to wash your hands well, and not everyone knows how to do that. Number two, here's an article about vaccines. It has saved lots of lives. Let me teach you about this. It's real simple, the first lessons I give. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's it, really good hand hygiene. Just, I mean, just be careful about touching your face. Maybe put some mittens on your hands or something like that. I don't know. We I wear gloves, and we also put on painters' overalls, the light ones over everything. I mean, and now yeah. Delta used to be the worst. Now they're somewhat the best because they're still reserving uh, middle seats, um, whereas American and, and United are not don't care anymore. Really, um, and it's tough. It's tough. I mean, yeah, yeah. The HEPA filter thing, though, is like, sure, it filters it out. And HEPA means like what they would use in a hospital, right? But yeah. let's say someone has COVID, they cough. <laughs> somehow it's got to get to the filter to be filtered, right? Mm -hmm. so, so by before it circulates, they don't no. tell you. Sorry. No, just don't, yeah, I wouldn't do a cruise right at this point in time. Um, <laughs> that was, those were, those were bombs. The, those, hey, those, why uh, are you going on a cruise? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Those were unfortunately um, 
I know people like cruises and my wife has always wanted to go on a cruise, but I've always warned her about the infection disease concerns about cruises. And, and the, that's, this is probably, this is obviously def, de decimated the cruise industry because you cannot socially distance in that sort of scenario, nor do they have protocols to, to really help uh, people once they get sick to, to kind of quarantine really effectively. So that that's, it's quite the challenge. The good news about airplane is that you're only on it for five hours and then you're off of it. Um, and it's not, and it, from what I hear, airports are pretty bare, bare minimum in terms of number of people there. So the lines are pretty short and hopefully people aren't standing right on top of each other um, in these lines. I mean, it, it, it's probably hit or miss, probably depends on what state you're in. Cause I have heard some things about people in Atlanta and how that was not, not, um, not too good. Hawaii is an amazing place. As we mentioned before the show, the lieutenant governor is an actual doctor, um, Josh Green. And um, where I am, as the low, there hasn't been a case ever in uh, three surrounding zip codes. That's like 50 miles. And there's, let's say you're kind of, I don't want to use quite the word, let's say you're a redneck guy, you've got your hunting dog in the back, and you've got, you know, you've got a shotgun in the front, you have a mask in Hawaii. And every time you go into a liquor, uh, the one liquor store, which gets a lot of business on Saturday, or the two markets, it says, wear your mask, you know, and nobody's allowed in. And on the other hand, you've got intergenerational families, which is knocking people out in a lot of places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... No, I mean, if you set it as sort of a standard and like a, a thing that you, you do for, for each other, and this is something that was second nature to countries like North Korea, Taiwan, Japan, areas like Hong Kong, they're like, okay, well, well, great. But now, I mean, even Germany, yeah, Germany is a perfect example. This is a highly modernized country. You go there and you almost step out and you almost think like, and sometimes you're like in the United States. Because uh, it kind of looks like it, because it was it was bombed to smithereens and they rebuilt it and it looks somewhat similar. Um, and so, but guess what? They have a their their prime minister is a scientist. Not, I mean, I'm a little biased for scientists, but Angela Merkel, I mean, she was on top of this, and the people followed. And and plus, they also developed the original test that most countries use. It's called the Roche test. It was the test that the um, CDC initially refused to use this is so this is going back to, into February where there were some mistakes being made the initially the United States said no we don't want the Roche test we feel like the CDC test is the best which it technically is if you did it right but it, it never panned out in terms of reproducing it in other state labs and they re, and they finally agreed to finally get this Roche test a month too late and so in Germany, they're up and running this test and testing everyone. And so the rates there are large. But even when you look at Germany, if you read German newspapers right now, and sometimes I kind of plug in there and look at them, there are sects of people who are not wanting to wear masks. So there, there are, there are protests. They're small, but it does exist there. Even in Germany, it does exist. How are the frontline doctors doing? How are you guys doing? What kinds of conversations are you guys having? What are the conversations or the signs that you're seeing that gives you hope that we can at some point manage it once we decentralize the politics out of it? And uh, just kind of where are you guys psychologically in respect to this thing? It probably depends where you're at. Um, I think in New York City, uh, psychologically, it was, it was pretty tough. Um, they were overwhelmed. Um, and you can read it in, in, uh, what, what, in the journals that they were writing and, and the doctors that were there. Um, my perspective is a little bit different. Um, we, we've been very collaborative. We've been working really uh, strongly together. It's moved us together um, because we've had to. We've had to develop a lot of protocols. There's been a lot of behind the scenes work um, outside of seeing patients on establishing what do we do with a surge? How do we test all these people? How do we still do like outpatient surgeries? How do we keep our staff healthy? And me, my biggest thing, so I'm an infectious disease doctor, so I'm in there seeing all these sick patients. I get consulted usually on the worst of the worst. And so my big thing is protecting my compadres, my nurses. They're taking the full brunt of it. And so my big thing is, is working with them, making sure that, that, I'm, that I'm with them and that, that we're on the same page and that what I'm doing and you're doing too. And so we're, we're all sort of 
really trying to be on the same page, working together, communicating really well. I think, it, I think at least I say from my perspective, uh, we've, we've come closer together. Now, it has been stressful. There are times where we're arguing because someone wants to do one thing, which I feel like is like totally experimental. I'm like, what are you doing? You just read that in one journal. Uh, you can't do that yet. Um, so there is a little bit of some back and forth, some collegial back and forth. And it's tough because earlier on the pandemic, I was doing things with medicines that, you know, you wouldn't find in a textbook, but we were forced to do this. Because otherwise, I'd be able to do nothing. And so we we found some things we're like, oh, wow, maybe this works a little bit or maybe this doesn't. And then they threw, this, threw all this thing in this hydroxychloroquine business and all this controversy there. The crazy thing about hydroxychloroquine and what the, probably a lot of the lay people don't know, it was the first line medication that everyone was using initially, especially in the hospital. It was number one go-to initially. Why is that? Well, how, did, how did that it come was, about? It was, I don't know. It was crazy because when I saw it, I was like, why? There was no data. There was zero data. It was all complete theory because the drug technically in vitro in a test tube is active on the virus. That's great. Prove it. Prove it in the human body. And guess what? It didn't work. Five, random, five randomized trials later, it bombed. And it's not a surprise, though, because when you look at it, other illnesses, so it's not like it hasn't been tested in other viruses. It bombed there, too. And so we don't use it, but it was being used an absolute ton. In New York City, it was the first-line regimen then. So they extrapt a, got a lot of data from there. No one's really using it, at least at my institution or out here on the West Coast. I, I can't say about other institutions and other places. We do have some new drugs that are promising, but they're really just not that good. And, there's, and here's the tricky part. Remember I told you, when these patients come in here, they come in here very late in their illness. The damage has been done. The virus has already peaked. So when you give a drug that's supposed to lower the virus down, when a virus has already peaked, there's nothing to lower. The replication capacity is already done. So drugs are only good that affect replication on the upswing early in illness. And so this new drug by Gilead, which is a local company here in the Bay Area uh, that produces a lot of HIV drugs. So Gilead had a drug called remdesivir. They've tried it for everything. It's an old drug, and it's, but it's, an, it's, it's what we call a pan-spectrum drug. So it works on a lot of different viruses. It works, as, works on the vi viral machinery. And so what it generally does, they used it in Ebola. It bombed there. It looked like it was going to be good in vitro. It bombed. It, they try to use it in hepatitis C, looked good in vitro, it bombed. And now they used it in coronavirus, maybe a little bit good, but only in those early patients, it looks good. But when the patient is in the ICU and they come at that point, it's no use. Here's the trick. The drug costs $3,000 a dose for a course for five days. So it's expensive. And so um, that's a trick. And so you have to establish protocols so it's not being used in patients where it has no benefit. Of course, more clinical data is going to be published, but at least I can say I can give someone something if they, if they at least present relatively early in the illness. Like I alluded to a gentleman who came in who's going to be discharged, like a 35-year-old who came in within his first five days of symptoms, and he got that drug, and he did, he did well. But I can't say that's going to be everyone, and the data is not fantastic. Even, even the UK, oximeter? yeah. If you have an oximeter, is that something that the older people should keep around? I mean, we yeah. have one in the house. We, take it, we look at it every once in a while. Explain what that is to the... Yeah, pulse ox. So what happens is, is that you, you can buy a machine, and so it uses a technology which uh, can, can look at your, basically your artery and is able to create a calculation of how much of your hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. And so that's a really key thing. So what happens is most patients, this is actually really good for primary care clinics to give to patients. So primary care clinics that may either suspect a COVID case that's may not sick enough to go to the hospital, but you, you're worried that they could get sicker, you give them like a pulse ox and if it drops below 90, you tend to be more concerned. And they're pretty cheap these days. They're like 20 bucks, $25. Um, not a, 
kind of a smart thing to have. I mean, I, I recommend it to primary care doctors to stock up on it and literally give it to patients who are um, kind of borderline. Never go anywhere without my oximeter. <laughs> well, if you have COPD, then it's a different story. You kind of need it. Uh, but not, not to assume that's what you got, but, but we do use oh, it for no. other diseases too. <laughs> well, let, can we go back to the flu thing just for a second? Thanks sure. so much for your time. Let's say uh, the two are together. Do they make each other worse? Or is it just that, oh, I have one or, and now I have the other, so it's going to be harder for me to uh, recover? Or is there some sort of biological horrible synergy that – will um, magnify the effect of the two so that the two is three? We don't know this. We don't know the answer to this. So far, I've not heard any signals of this. Nothing published out of Australia. Uh, nothing, because remember this COVID-19 started in, in sort of February-ish, January, where flu was still hanging around a little bit. Nothing that we saw then. I don't think so. The tricky part is flu even though most people do well with the flu, flu is no picnic either. No. So flu's got a mortality rate of 0.1%, which sounds low. But when you think about it, flu infects up to 20% of the U.S. population every year. So if you take 20% of the U.S. population and you multiply it times 0.1, that tends to be a big number. So we do get a lot of flu deaths Unfortunately, they were trying to compare this to the flu, and a lot of people with the, the, what we call on the hoax conversation side were like, well, it's not as much as the flu. The flu causes more deaths. And we haven't had a flu season that's caused 150 plus thousand deaths, and that's what we're sitting at right now here in the United States, and that's only going to go up. Because I tell you one thing, these Florida cases and Arizona and Texas cases that have spiked and are now kind of slightly coming down when you look at per 100,000 capita, yeah. the deaths come later. The mm. deaths come one to two to three weeks later. Remember those patients I told you that stay in the hospital for weeks? They don't necessarily die of the COVID. They die of the complications of it. And that's usually a little bit later. And so when you look at the death per capita, those states are climbing. And they probably will continue to climb and then peak. Um, I think Arizona is dropping a little bit because they sort of peaked earlier and they, what I've heard, uh, did a fairly good job with um, um, getting masked up after much delay, of course. Terrible fancy question. If you die later of pneumonia or something a lot close to probably that, is that go down as a COVID death? Yeah, it does. It definitely does. Uh, because, I mean, if, if the person that does the death certificate correctly um, uh, sh should do that. So it would be pneumonia um, and it, it would be more than one cause of death, but it, but it, but it would be. It, it still would be, especially if it's the same hospitalization that you could as, uh, assume that that obviously weakened the body in a way. Um, okay. Yeah. I think of... Uh... If that were the case, I think um, we had what cases in Florida and in Texas, I think where they were not counting correctly to uh, fudge the numbers and those people got uh, whistleblowers got let go. And uh, I mean, it, one way to, to, to get people back to work. Right. But, I mean, when you when you have people talking about how if we don't test, we won't have high numbers. <laughs> it, it's to, to, to think that that's. A, a logical uh, way to go. Yes, that, that's correct. So from a factual standpoint, that's correct. So I can't say that that's a lot. But, but to do that, to recommend that is, is not right. And it's actually cruel. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a cruel thing. And I the, the, yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it, it goes down to more pathology that probably my wife as a psychologist could explain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at the time, and I want to be cognizant not only of your time, but sure. our time keeping of this in the viewership. Uh, just so we can, because we're getting towards the end, just to maybe perhaps end this on a on somewhat of a positive note as much as we can. What are we learning from this in respect? When you said we've been, we've been through this for only six months, I was a bit shocked because it feels like six years, right? Yeah. Every morning yeah. you wake up, you get a heavy dose of this. 
on the news, I mean, through your conversations, even how you wake up and go about your day, we are carrying this. So six months have felt like six years. What are scientists in the medical community learning from this in respect to their having to collaborate, their having to speak to each other, their having to essentially find answers to this uniformly because it's impacting everyone at the same time? How could this? How is this possibly shaping how scientists and, and people within the medical community are going to come together and um, manage disease and manage collaboration? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it re- what it's really doing is hi- highlighting our, um, our weaknesses and our strengths. I mean, that's really what it what it, what it did. It was basically like a, a deal breaker. Um, and uh, the, the, the thing with the United States is that we had a head start on this, uh, that, that, uh, that some places really were able to take advantage of and other places, unfortunately, couldn't take advantage of. And like I alluded to that study at Stanford, oh, how we are so lucky in Northern California to have an academic mecca there. And that saved thousands of lives. There, there's, just, there's, there's just no doubt that one week avoiding St. Patrick's Day and everyone going out, Mardi, Mardi Gras obliterated New Orleans. And we, we, we started learning about this as doctors right away from doctors on the front lines, just posting on blogs and seeing what they're seeing. And so what's fascinating at being, being myself as a specialist is, is, is that we're getting this just inundated with information whether it's validated or not, some things are coming out really fast. And so you have to take everything with a grain of salt, but you want to also uh, respect what you're reading. So you don't want to be rapidly changing your practice, but you're waiting for the next big thing. The biggest thing that came out actually in the last month or so uh, was giving steroids. And that's the, this is something that I'm not sure all you, all, all you know, but in the medical community, this was impactful so we initially so this just shows you how wrong we were how remember i was telling you about strengths weaknesses and also looking and seeing we weren't right all along and they weren't using in new york city their the initial guidelines that were published that were saying this is what you could do you treat with hydroxychloroquine that obviously is is off we're not doing that anymore maybe some people are god forbid um but they also recommended do not give steroids at any cost. At no scenario do you give it unless you absolutely have to give it. And they were basing it on data from the SARS epidemic 20 years ago. There was small data from 20 years ago, a different virus, a coronavirus, but a different virus showing that steroids were harmful. And so no one gave them. And so lo and behold, you have this impactful giant randomized study out of England about a month ago. It's been published in the Journal of Medicine the last two weeks. So you can look at it with your own eyes and show that steroids are massively helpful, with, <laughs> especially with severe disease, and that the mortality benefit was off the charts. And so we were doing it all wrong. And I, and I will tell you, anecdotally, there were cases where we were like pulling our hair out, thinking, what are we going to do for this patient? And then we finally bucked and gave steroids and we saw the patients do better. And we're like, wait a second here. Are we missing something? And lo and behold, guess what? Everyone's using steroids now on every case. You need to use steroids. Do you mean the steroid shot? For instance, I had like yeah. a staff thing from yeah. the coral injury and well, I'll, maybe I'll, put it on I'll top put, of the dermatology. Well, I'll, I'll put, I'll, 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 I'll put, a, I'll put a, a specific thing about the steroid. It's only for patients who are hypoxic, so have low oxygen. So patients who have what we call severe illness. So people are hospitalized. So these aren't for outpatients. They actually showed that the steroids had no benefit whatsoever in the outpatient population or even the mildly ill. But the severely ill, which I happen to see every single day, it was massively impactful. The mortality benefit was amazing. Everyone's doing it now. You can give it orally. You can give it by intravenous. Ah. It, yeah, the dose depends on either one of those. And they showed that 10 days worth, at least 10 days, kept more people alive. We weren't doing that in the beginning. No one was. We had guidelines 
that were through big medical centers. Remember, these guidelines weren't based on great evidence, right? We were collecting evidence. We were collecting good trials. This was stuff out of Harvard, Stanford, UCSD. Look at all those early ones. I could show you. It said steroids don't give unless you absolutely have to. Now everyone's giving it. And we're probably reaping the benefit uh, from that here. And it probably would have saved a lot of lives earlier on in Italy and other countries that got decimated. Leave us on a high note. Our time is almost up. So leave us on a high note. What, what the, uh, give us some reason to be hopeful. Well, I, I think the reason to be helpful is that we have learned a lot. We have hardened ourselves in these hospitals and we are ready. We be, I have um, seen hundreds of patients and I've hardened myself to see these tough cases and to tell the doctors, get me involved and get me involved early. Because when you get us involved, we're going to help them because we've already seen it. We know it. Earlier on in the illness, we hadn't seen it. We hadn't known as much. I wouldn't know what to do. Now, you give me that same problem, I'm going to be able to handle it now. It's a different story now. So we're a lot more knowledgeable and we're learning things. And we can hopefully apply what we learn to other things in the future because we all have been ready um, in, a, in a way. You know, obviously, there was a pandemic task force that was you know, you know, shut down about a year ago. The reason why that existed we were, we were fearful not of a coronavirus pandemic, although we kind of knew something would come up at some point in time. We're always fearful of an avian flu. And so avian flu is basically a mutation in flu that gets bird DNA in there and becomes highly pathogenic. 1918 is all I have to say. Tens of millions of people throughout the world died of avian flu. All we're doing is repeating a similar thing over again. Avian flu from 1918 was technically more pathogenic when you look at it pound for pound as compared to COVID-19. But we can learn a lot from that. Unfortunately, we, we're, we're trying to learn the same things we learned back then. And hopefully, we'll take this all in. What I can say is that we've been hardened and we're smarter. I'm ready for all of them. Um, and I can go in my room and look to my patient's eyes. And for the most of them, I can say, hey, we got this. Hey, we got this. Trust me. We got this. Before, there's no way I was going to say that. But now I'm holding their hands and I'm saying, hey, man, hey, we got this. We got this. So I, I, I welcome we're... to be on again if you guys need me to be on again uh, later time. There's more time at a later time. So I think we have to slow you, Dr. Evans, really. I think this is the most basic information that uh, the guys and Amanda have put out on a, on a show, and it's fascinating. We could go on for quite a while, but thank you, and thank your team at Marin General, right? And you yeah. are the medical director. Yeah. yeah we yeah. actually thank all the medical professionals on the front line who go out every day putting themselves at risk. In, in, in a, not only in a situation where we have a disease that's unpredictable, but also we have it in a political climate that actually com complicates and bring complexity to the work you guys do. So I think all three of us, Abel, Steve, myself, Amanda, we thank you for the work we do, you guys do. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're, we're we're, whatever yeah. we can do. And I think the biggest thing I'm taking away from this is wear a mask, wash your hands, be socially distant, doesn't cost anything. It's an act of empathy for your fellow man and it's good for society. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. Ladies and gentlemen, Abel, thank you. Steve, thank you. Come. Steve is still in Hawaii. Abel and I are in San Diego holding the fort down. So um, come anytime you're ready. Abel and I have got your back here. Um, yeah. Amanda, thank you so much for putting this platform together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Perspectives and we thank you for watching. This will be on YouTube, on Bella V TV. Tune in, hit subscribe, share, and we look forward to seeing you at it for our next show. Thank you so much.